Hi there, I'm George Dahl, and welcome, welcome back to my film journal. Today we're talking about a guy named Frederick Knott, who wrote a trio of murder mystery slash crime plays in the 1950s and 60s, two of which were adapted into feature films, one of them by the master, and it became a staple of his oeuvre, Hitchcock's Dial M for Murder, starring Grace Kelly and Ray Milland. Solid flick. 1967, Terrence Young, hot off a run on the Bond films directing Dr. No and from Rush With Love. He's a hot property. He directs the high-profile script of Wait Until Dark with Audrey Hepburn, Richard Crenna, and Alan Arkin. Now, full disclosure here, I actually played the Alan Arkin role of the orchestrator of the crime Harry wrote when I was in high school in our production, our lowly, humble production of Wait Until Dark. And it was a lot of fun. And I think maybe it gives me a little bit of a unique perspective since I repeated these lines ad nauseum for months back in the day. I can watch the movie and I can almost repeat it word for word. Uh, it's a great script. It was a lot of fun to do. And uh, it's a distinction that proudly puts me in the same pantheon or it's same tradition as greats like Quentin Tarantino. And we'll get into that later, of course. Uh, it's a great murder mystery. It's about a woman, played by Hepburn, who's become recently blinded. And through a series of circumstances, she's come into the possession of a child's doll. Unbeknownst to her, it's stuffed with heroin. And three crooks scheme, playing the roles of a police officer, a long-lost friend of her husband's, etc., to try to swindle the doll out of her possession. It's got a lot of murder, a lot of twists and turns, and a really cataclysmic, awesome ending that involves the entire screen and the theater going black, save for one light from a match. Uh, it's a really terrific movie. Great play as well if you ever get a chance to see it. Let's get right into it. Wait Until Dark from 1967. The film begins with a dose of cinematic adrenaline that evades the theater, an opening sequence not seen in the play, as we are introduced to the character of Lisa on stage referenced only in dialogue, here played by model cover girl Samantha Jones. We see Lisa procure the drug mule doll from an elderly cohort, evade customs officials, and ultimately hand off the package to an unsuspecting traveler when she spots the leering character of Harry Rote on the tarmac. I actually really like this opening sequence because it gives the audience a quick glimpse into the seedy underworld operations of our loose confederacy of crooks. The idea that violent crime is operating in plain sight all around us, even at an innocuous public space like an airport under our very nose, adds a certain lurid curiosity, as well as an anxiety in the viewer that sometimes these violent criminal vendettas spill out of their own hermetic bubbles and into our ostensibly safe domestic situations, and can come even to plague the volatile and innocent Audrey Hepburn. Next, we're introduced to our leading man, Richard Crenna, and his cohort, Carlito. Crenna, a veteran good guy actor, here tries his hand at being bad, wearing a mysterious yet fashionable black coat. Though even his name, Mike Tallman, implies a certain amount of forthrightness and resolution, and we'll come to see that the audience can actually lean on Tallman for a sense of safety, especially when compared to the true villain of the piece, Arkin's despicable beatnik criminal Harry Rote, who enters the film looking very cool wearing mysterious sunglasses and inexplicably carrying a large rug meant to dispose of a body. And soon, after an excellent monologue... Our run-of-the-mill criminal duo learns that they've stumbled into a mess bigger than they have anticipated. <laughs> As they have been effectively blackmailed into helping the sinister rote, their fingerprints, left so wantonly earlier, now tying them to a crime scene. Haven't you forgotten something? We just earned the money. I mean, fingerprints. You just signed your names all over this place. And inextricably into Rote's scheme. His scheme? To hoodwink a blind woman into giving them access to a small black safe, where Rote, having searched the entire apartment, believes the heroin doll to be hidden. Thus begins an elaborate ruse involving many disguises and scenarios to play out for the benefit of the blind Hepburn. Rote plays the role of a jilted husband, 
Carlito as a police officer, and Mike as a long-lost friend of her husband's from the war. Are these Sam's, these pictures? Yes. I thought so. Hey, here's one of me. <laughs> I sure have put on a few pounds since those days. All designed to undermine Hepburn's faith in her husband, the man who was handed the doll in the opening scene. You said that Sam brought a doll back from Canada. You said it's the same doll that Rote described. You went right down the line and told me that it proved that Sam and Mrs. Rote were connected. And now Mrs. Rote's dead, murdered right next door. Maybe I was wrong. That doesn't matter. If you thought that way, the police will think that way. Without the doll, it's just a lot of ranting and raving from those crazy roads. But with the doll, the police have a case involving Sam. Mike. Do you understand that? But unbeknownst to Rote, Hepburn's obnoxious upstairs neighbor, Gloria, actually has had the doll the entire time. I suppose that the big cynical question that one could pose when watching this film is, hey, if you think that the doll is in the safe, why doesn't Harry Rote just come in with a gun, hold Audrey Hepburn at gunpoint, and force her to open it? Why the gigantic theatrical charade? Well, I would say to you, where is the fun in that? It's a lot to keep track of and a lot to explain, and I'm not going to waste time here explaining every intricacy of the plot. You'll have to see it for yourself. But believe me when I say that not steel trap writing keeps it all on track, and Hepburn's performance really sells it. You had it. I was only borrowing. No, you quickly got to hide it. Where is it? Give it to me. The film was produced by Hepburn's then-husband, Mel Ferreira, who had starred with her in War and Peace, as he desired to find a role for his wife that really demonstrated her acting chops. And we can see that Wait Until Dark is a natural extension of her performance and her desperation in Charade. Playing a blind woman under constant duress, the focus on her character and her struggle to win her freedom from being a pawn in this sick game is something that really sets this movie apart from and is a big improvement over Dial M for Murder, Knott's other play, which can easily be viewed as a companion piece to this one, in which an unsuspecting woman played by Grace Kelly is targeted for murder by her jealous husband, Ray Land. The big difference between Dial M for Murder and Wait Until Dark is in Wait Until Dark, we actually feel sympathy for the victimized character. Whereas Grace Kelly, I hate to say that she's not sympathetic, but like she's not really even in the film. She's just sort of like this victimized character. Now, that's not to say that in Dial M for Murder, we want to see Grace Kelly die. Of course not. That would be terrible. But as we tend to do in films... The person you spend the most time with, the person who's making moves, who's got plans, who has a forward-moving objective, that being the murdering husband, Ray Milland, you tend to sympathize and root for. Now, maybe that's more of an indictment of my own thinking than of the screenplay, but look, you want to see Ray Milland. Shit, he's worked so hard. He's planned. When he's on the phone and you're he's waiting to hear and he's looking at his watch and he's like, when's it going to go off? When's it going to go off? The suspense really and perversely, and I think maybe Hitchcock knew this, does not come from your wanting Grace Kelly to survive. It's from your wanting to see his ingenious plan get pulled off. Now, however, in Wait Until Dark, I think not maybe recognize this issue. And so therefore he gives Audrey Hepburn's character a disability. She's become recently blind. She's working to try to survive and adapt to this new lifestyle. She's alone. She's vulnerable. And throughout this movie, she self-actualizes and she proves to herself that she can be the world's greatest blind woman. Do I have to be the world's champion blind lady? Yes. By surviving, by defeating Harry Rowe. And we really are on her side. There's really no perversity here to where you're like, mm, I hope the villains pull off their plan. You don't want them to. But I'd say the most engaging aspect of the production and an element that stands out, especially on stage, are the sort of play within a play scenarios that make up the framework of this story. This is an effective narrative device that Quentin Tarantino has used to great effect in much of his work, as characters often play roles in an orchestrated scheme in order to usually get information from other characters. And it works really well on multiple levels, watching Hepburn slowly realize that something is amiss, watching the glances between the con men as they communicate only with their eyes and improvise on the fly. It's all very enjoyable. It's expert blocking. There's a lot for the actors to do to keep things interesting in what would otherwise be scene after scene of exposition. And speaking briefly of Quentin Tarantino real quick, let's talk about the famous director and at the height of his fame in the mid-90s actually playing Harry Rote opposite Marissa Tomei in a Broadway revival. 
the roles originally played by Lee Remick and Robert Duvall in the mid-1960s. And his production was met with something less than a plum. In fact, Tarantino, who I actually think is an interesting actor, I think he's very effective in the first half of From Dust Till Dawn, for instance, never has spoken publicly about his Broadway debut. But we do know from interviews that he's given that Frederick Knott has been very influential in his writing. The climax is kicked off very effectively with a really sudden and shocking demarcation point as Richard Crenna, who I said before was one of the only characters we can really lean on for a sense of stability as he is murdered viciously by rote. It's a real shock. And I remember during the play, that was a moment in which everything sort of shifts and the audience gets ready for something really different and really scary. Finally, the film ends with dueling performances of intensity and desperation between Hepburn and Arkin as they negotiate the high ground between the two. It's very intense. It's the climax that most people remember and take with them out of the theater. And it's also a really jarring but effective departure from the more formalistic tete-a-tete between the characters in the first and second act. Yeah, the ending is incredibly brutal. I mean, and it was like that when we staged it, too. And when I played Rote, I mean, I hate to say this, but he's such a dastardly conniving character. After a while of doing that over and over and over again, it it actually does start to take a toll on you, like physically and mentally. And you start to be, it it really does exhaust you to be that evil all the time. No, I had fun. It's great to choose scenery and be bad. And boy, is that ending scene staged terrifically. I mean, it still is frightening. Um, you know, I know back in the day, people, I think they said Jack Warner jumped up out of his chair. I don't know if that would necessarily happen today. Nowadays, most of the spectacle for a modern audience can be appreciated on the level of the performances and as well as a low light photography by cinematographer Charles Lang. And it's a sequence that effectively anticipates how popular low light photography would become due to work by cinematographers like Gordon Willis in films like The Godfather and Clute. It's a very effective and exciting climax. Arkin is seething here with anger. He's gone off the chain, and Hepburn is really unleashed here. She lets it all go, and she really pours her heart out. She does a great job carrying this movie on her back. She is strong-willed, and you believe that she could survive an encounter with Harry Rote just through her cunning and her tenacity alone. I love it. I think that uh, I love these kinds of stories. I wish that I was able to write something like this. This would make a great double feature. I would obviously recommend that you watch Dylan for Murder. Um, Also, another movie that would go really well with this would be uh, Hitchcock's Rope. That would be a great little triple feature if you were uh, so inclined. Uh, If you would like to uh, give some alms to the poor, like and subscribe. That would be terrific. And I'll see you next time.